such an very smart. There we go. Are we still welcoming uh, a few more people in, uh, Salio? Yeah, we're we're welcoming a couple more people. So uh, while I set um, uh, everything up, sixty more seconds would that be appropriate? Yeah, that would be perfect. Okay. So uh, we'll uh, just uh, fill this uh, quiet time with uh, a little bit of introduction as we wait uh, for uh, eight o'clock. Uh, the eight o'clock uh, gong to sound. I'm seeing more and people, more and more people come in, Celio. So I'm just uh, <clears throat> holding my thoughts. Eight o'clock or two a.m. Or two a.m. Two a.m. Berlin Standard Time. <laughs> Excellent. Yakshimayish. Kujadabra. Oh my goodness. Mountain comes to Mohammed. The mountain. Start video. Mohammed. You can't start video because the host has stopped it. Okay. Um, you, yeah, Russ, yeah, you got to mute. Okay. There we go. Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to the July PHSC, the Photographic Historical Society of Canada, the July event. A little bit of an unprecedented uh, time. Um, opportunity presented itself to have a wonderful speaker present in July, so we took it. Folks, we are the PHSC, the Photographic Historical Society of Canada. Uh, we research, promote, investigate, discuss, uh, research all things, mainly, we try to make it Canadian, but we're not up against uh, worldwide photographic historical endeavors. PHSC, we hold monthly program meetings just like this. We're used to in-person meetings, but of course, because of COVID, we started doing these Zoom meetings. Um, if you wanna know what's coming up, uh, visit our website. I'm gonna be referring to that website a lot, so you might wanna write it down, www.phsc.ca, which of course stands for Photographic Historical Society of Canada.ca. In addition to these monthly program meetings, we produce a smashing journal, outstanding bunch of research, the photographic, Canadiana Journal four times a year. Uh, also, a monthly email newsletter. We'd encourage you to sign up for that monthly email newsletter. It's completely free. Again, go to our website. All we need is your email address. And once a month, you get a, a very, very well done um, um, newsletter uh, appeals to many demographics, many, many interests. Invariably, there's something interesting in there for you. Uh, as well, we hold live fairs where you can come buy and sell and trade photographic equipment, auctions uh, twice a year, live. We're, 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 we're so looking forward to doing that once again. Uh, we have a, a huge inventory uh, of stuff to auction off. Uh, people keep asking about the fair. Hopefully, maybe they'll let us do it in the fall. If not, there's always 2022. Now, Outdoors, we hold trunk sales. And the good news is, you heard it here first, there will be one in August. We haven't quite decided if it's going to be the 15th or the 22nd of August. That's the Sunday in our usual location uh, at Evans and Islington in beautiful southern Etobicoke in the southwest corner of Toronto in person. Um, again, uh, for confirmation of that, visit our, uh, visit our website, www.phsc.ca. And how, uh, just, uh, you know, we are, a, we are a society, we do meet in person, we have a, we do have a, uh, a board of directors, we have an executive who fulfill various roles for the society, sadly, um, we do have to pass along uh, the passing of uh, two of our very near and dear friends, um, John Cantemir, our, our vice president, uh, passed away uh, recently. Um, and as well, Bob Lansdale, the editor of our journal, passed away. Um, for obituaries, again, and links, um, uh, please check out our website. Uh, uh, John Cantemir's funeral was uh, a week ago, Tuesday, which also happens to be the day that Bob Lansdale passed away. His funeral is on Sunday. And again, check our website for the details. It's going to be live streaming a little bit. Anyway, 
So to keep up to speed, like I say, I encourage you to visit the website, uh, phsc.ca. Our, our webmaster is here tonight, Mr. Robert Carter. Um, journal, fantastic piece of research, newsletter. Um, and you got to say to yourself, boy, oh boy, I'm really excited about this PHSC thing. How do I sign up, Clint? How do I, what's the deal? How can I become a member? Very easy. $35. It's all it costs. Um, in normal times, we print a journal and send that out to you four times a year. Um, lately, because of COVID, we've been producing it as a PDF. And there it shows up in your mailbox four times a year. $35. Go to the website. Um, and, you know, this society is a good thing to support it. It pays various for various things. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we fund scholarships at photography schools at Ryerson, and we're very proud to, of that association. Um, and, and it, you know, we keep up to speed and, and keep bringing in interesting member, uh, members and speakers. So um, that's important. Folks, uh, you didn't come to see, to hear me babble on. Um, uh, program coordinator, Celio Brato has once again scored. He's brought in a spectacular speaker. And I know the, in, the presentation is gonna be very, very interesting. No pressure. Um, I pass it all on to Celio right now to introduce tonight's speaker. Welcome everyone. Uh, it is quite wonderful to have you all here tonight to see Dr. Hanin Hanoush's special PHSC guest lecture. We're very lucky that she has accepted our invite to come and talk about the Lipman process, a uh, process that is actually quite lit, apparently. Dr. Hanoush is a postdoctoral researcher at the, and I'm probably going to murder the name of this uh, museum, Ethnologisch Museum uh, from the Berlin State Museums, uh, the Prussian Cultural Heritage Center uh, Foundation, I mean, uh, in cooperation with the Max Planck uh, Kunsthistorisches Institute in Florence, uh, Italy. Her projects on color photography uh, begin about uh, 1900, and they're numerous. Besides her monograph on color photography in Imperial Germany, uh, currently, which is currently in preparation, she is uh, the volume editor of Gabriel Lippmann's Color Photography Science Media Museums with Amsterdam University Press, uh, which will be coming out late 2021, early 2022. We might have Dr. Hanoush on again then. <laughs> right, and she's the guest editor of another special issue dedicated entirely to three color photography at the KHI's 4A lab art histories, archaeologies, anthropologies, aesthetics, and uh, at the Berlin uh, State Museums. And she's an international fellow at the German Maritime Museum at the Leibniz, Leibniz uh, Institute for Maritime History. She received her PhD from IMT Luca School of Advanced Studies in Italy with a dissertation titled Art History as Janus, Sergei Eisenstein on the visual arts after her international master's in art history and museology at the Ecole de Louvre in Paris and the University of Heidelberg. And another master's MBA at the Université Saint-Épry, the Catholic? I, 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 I probably it's murdered. It's okay, it's Sorry. a Lebanese university, don't worry. All right, so uh, without any further delay, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Hanin Hanoush. Well, hello everyone. I'm gonna start by sharing my presentation. I hope you can all see it. Thumbs up, Celio? Yes? Okay. So- um, Yep, all good. Perfect. So thank you very much to the PHSC for inviting me. I am delighted to be here today. Thank you, Celio, very much for taking care of all organizational matters and IT, et cetera. I am just thrilled. I'm currently in Germany. It's 2 a.m. and I am happy to be here joining you for this late night, for me, late night talk about color photography. And thank you all very much for the attendees for taking the time to hear my talk. It will last around 40 minutes, after which I look forward to your questions. So as Celio mentioned, I am currently writing a monograph about color photography in Imperial Germany 
which focuses on the relationships between three color photography and the Lippmann process. So this year, 2021 is extra special for me. And it is special because it marks the centenary of Luxembourgian French physicist Gabriel Lippmann's death. He perished on board the steamer France on his way home from North America. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I have taken his centenary as an opportunity to bring my research on color photography to fruition with my upcoming edited volume, which Celio was kind enough to mention, called Gabriel Lippmann's Color Photography, Science Media Museums with Amsterdam University Press, and an upcoming exhibition about Lippmann photography with Preuss Museum, the National Museum of Photography in Norway. This exhibition is called Slow Color Photography, and it will open on August 28th. So if you can travel to Norway in body or in spirit, I welcome you all to attend it. So today I'm going to start by introducing Lippmann's colorful work in context before moving on to Richard Neuhaus's use of a stuffed parrot as the test object of the Lippmann process. <clears throat> So the question that motivates my research deals with Lippmann's legacy. A hundred years after his death, what have we as photography scholars and enthusiasts learned about him? What do we know about the context in which his color photography emerged? And what does all this mean for the history of photography and the way that is and the way in which it's written? The story of interferential color photography traditionally begins on February 2nd, 1891, at the Academy of Science in Paris, when Gabriel Lippmann presented a color image of a light spectrum using silver halides and albumin as his emulsion. In doing so, his image supported the theory of the wave nature of light. Now the spectrum you see here is basically light when split through a prism and then photographed. The wave nature of light is something which all of you kind of experience on a daily basis. When you go to the bathroom, for example, to wash your hands and you look at a soap bubble and you see the colors in the bubble, well, these colors are the results of light waves interfering with each other and are not the result of, say, dye stuff or pigments, like with the color of your t-shirt or your hair. Hence the term interferential photography to designate this kind of color photography by Lippmann. Lippmann's research was shaped by the political context in which it emerged, a context that is conspicuously missing from all social media events this year to highlight his centenary, and from a lot of um, the histories of photography written about him by photography historians. His nationality, as I mentioned at the beginning, is Luxembourgian French, and this needs a bit of unpacking. The Lippmann family lived in Luxembourg for generations, where, where they ran a successful factory for leather manufacturing and dyeing. Still, Gabriel Lippmann's father, Isai Lippmann, would not be included in the electoral role to vote in his community of Hollerich in 1845 because he was Jewish. Fed up with anti-Semitism in Luxembourg, shortly after Gabriel's birth, the Lippmanns moved their family and company to France where the installation of the Code Napoléon allowed them to remain. Mm. France, however, was hardly a safe haven. If someone has their microphone still on, it's really cute. <laughs> Anyways, Gabriel Lippmann's color photography transpired in the shadow of the Dreyfus affair. Through a spectacular miscarriage of justice and anti-Semitism, Captain Alfred Dreyfus was sentenced to life imprisonment for treason in 1894, having allegedly divulged French military secrets to the German Empire which turned out to be completely false, but only decades later after the damage was done. Lippmann was a Dreyfusard who asserted Dreyfus's innocence and understood the perfidious nature of the political catastrophe. 
at the time, the continuous rise of the French far right and its xenophobic, chauvinist and anti-Semitic overtones directed at former Dreyfusard made Lippmann the target of La France Profonde. La France Profonde is a proto-fascist set of ideas that underscored the importance of rural life away from the centrality of Paris and was led by monarchist journalist Léon Daudet. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree because Léon Daudet's father, Alphonse Daudet, was not exactly leading the revolution. Also, because Lippmann supported his former student from La Sorbonne University, Marie Skolodowska Curie's campaign to become a member, finally become a member of the French Academy of Science. And because he would not publicly condemn her clandestine love affair with physicist Paul Langevin, which by then was known far and wide in the press, he was repeatedly attacked by Dodé, who called him in writing, and I quote, the Jew of color photography. End quote. Yet, when Lippmann finally won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1908 for his interferential color process, the French press heralded the success as a national and nationalist victory against his German rival, quantum physicist Max Planck. Thus, Lippmann was the poster boy for the supremacy of French physics within the Franco-German rivalry, but in France itself, he was belittled and shamed on a variety of levels for being Jewish. Across the Rhine and the German Empire, less than two months after Lippmann's disclosure of the color spectrum you see here, German photochemistry professor Hermann Wilhelm Vogel presented Lippmann's work to his colleagues at the Physikalische Gesellschaft zu Berlin, the Berlin Physical Society. Vogel claimed, however, that Lippmann was not the first physicist to achieve these results. The first person to do so was the obscure scientist Wilhelm Zenka. And although today I will not be discussing that Zenka, Lippmann, Lippmann, Zenka, debate that kept going on and on um, in, in the German Empire, it is important to know that from within the way the history of photography was written in Germany, Lippmann was not the first color photographer. So from the get-go, the Lippmann process was inseparable not only from the fight for the European supremacy in physics following the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-1871, from anti-Semitism, but it was also inseparable from the heated nationalist claims to the first color photograph. Which is why institutions today, in my opinion, with these kinds of color collections have a specific duty towards telling its complex history and its ties to various forms of discrimination and imperialism. The intensity of the debates about color in the 19th century, which were both scientific and political in nature, may surprise some photography historians today. Peter Geimer's statement that in the 19th century, and I quote, color photography did not exist, apart from some marginal exceptions that had little influence on the understanding of photography, end quote, is for me emblematic of the exclusion of color photography from the general history of the medium. I consider this narrative about the non-existence of color photography to be unsustainable. It is largely propelled by the notion that color photography around 1900 is early and early color is therefore irrelevant because the really groundbreaking work only took place much later, like with Kodak, with the Polaroid, etc. And so it is a very teleological way of understanding photography that I find doesn't really work for this kind of research. To me, color photography is neither early nor late. 
The problem with it is how its history was written, often only a technical history, severing it from politics, from science, and from its various stakeholders. My overall work focuses on the entanglements between various color technologies, such as the Lippmann process and three color photography, and the circulation of knowledge between them during imperialism in order to argue that technology and ideology are in fact co-produced. Case in point is doctor of medicine, anthropologist and interferential photographer, Richard Neuhaus and his test object. Through the test object that is a stuffed parrot and testing, I examined the relationship between two technologies of empire, color photography and taxidermy. Neuhaus had enough theoretical and practical knowledge about photography to take a step towards the Lippmann process, no doubt a daunting step. He was already known in Berlin as an anthropologist who traveled to Australia, New Zealand, and Hawaii several times starting 1884, and as a collector of objects and of human remains, and as the producer of two photographic racial atlases of people living in the countries which he visited. So he gifted everything he gathered uh, abroad under who knows what circumstances, because the provenance of his collections remain unclear, to the Ethnologisches Museum in Berlin, that is my current employer. Neuhaus was also famous for his photomicrographic skills, which he used for the depiction of snow crystals in order to study their asymmetrical structure and for the depiction of more human remains especially the inner ear of people. So the inner ear or the middle ear was notoriously difficult to turn into a biological specimen and to be photographically depicted. So in Germany, Neuhaus was considered the first photographer to succeed in this kind of representation. From the 1880s until his death, Neuhaus tried and wrote extensively about several photographic processes, mostly in color, and published his results in the journal Photographischer Rundschau, which he also edited. He knew that the interest in and the development of interferential photography largely depended on the reliability of its visual results. Results, however, are only as reliable as their testing conditions at the center of which lies choosing the right test object, by no means an easy task. Neuhaus rejected flowers as test objects for the Lippmann process. He quickly dismissed them as unfavorable, since when in the field, they are easily shaken by the wind and any movement, even a blossoming bud, made itself unpleasantly noticeable. When flowers are cut, they are quick to wilt and drop, and the subtle movement also disturbs the capture of the image. He also excluded landscapes where the color red, such as the roof of a house, is prominent due to the danger it presents in contaminating the other colors unless the photographer is particularly apt. So those of you interested in three color photography will know that once photographers got the color red under control after 1902, they were just using it left, right, and center, like a red umbrella, a red dress, like you can't escape the color red um, and, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Given the technical complexity of interferential photography, the toxicity of the needed chemicals, and its long exposure time, ranging from 10 minutes to over three hours, depending on the image, its access to the world is mediated through the still, slow, and docile, and less through the instantaneous and the moving. And the three-hour exposure time uh, is actually a photomicrographic Lippmann plate. So it's a photograph that Neuhaus took of a liver section with a parasite uh, in it. So he took it through a microscope 
and he was working on emulsions and he recorded uh, an exposure time of three hours and 15 minutes. So the Lipman process is best conducted in a controlled or familiar environment, such as one's own house, or with a static and colorful object like a piece of textile, or with a very compliant sitter, such as the photographer himself. But in order to overtake these limitations, and to provide a stable, to, to provide stable and valid testing conditions, interferential photographers had to rely on another medium that could annihilate motion while stabilizing the colors of an object or an animal, which is where taxidermy comes into play. One of Neuhaus's most representative plates you see here features the same stuffed superb parrot, which he photographed over 300 times starting 1898. And I know this based on his laboratory notes that are held at the Preuss Museum. So when photographing the parrot, Neuhaus was trying to figure out just how sensitive was the emulsion. If one of the parrot's colors did not appear in the image, let's say green, it meant that the emulsion was maybe blind to green and had to be changed. You had to work on the recipe again. Or that another aspect of the experiment has failed. For example, the mercury was impure or who knows, but something went wrong and you had to go back and do the work. Because of the contrast between its various colors and the different exposure times needed for red and for green, the stuffed parrot was challenging to photograph. Success in depicting it meant that Neuhaus had mastered all possible parameters of his interferential experiment. So this image you see here literally means that nothing went wrong at no point in the photographic process. Or if it did, it could be kind of, there, is, there was a solution for it. And this did not happen every day and it still doesn't uh, with contemporary photographers who use the Lipman process. So as Lorna Roth and Sarah Lewis's research on the Shirley card has shown, test objects are politically charged. The fact that images of white women were repeatedly and exclusively chosen to calibrate camera settings for portraits speaks volumes about how technology and race are in fact co-produced and about the selective visibility enabled by the camera that was and still is incapable of nuanced depictions of people with a skin darker than this. So what does this mean for Neuhaus to have chosen a stuffed parrot as his test object and what does this choice communicate? Other than talking about the dead parrot as a test object for emulsion sensitivity, Neuhaus has not mentioned capturing, stuffing, or purchasing the parrot seen in the photo. Therefore, the provenance of the stuffed animal remains unclear. I have not been able to locate much information about it other than two facts. The bird is today indigenous to Australia not to Germany, surprise, surprise, an area which Neuhaus visited and studied as an anthropologist. And that Neuhaus saw and mentioned the living bird during his second anthropological expedition to Papua New Guinea from 1908 to 1910, which was also sponsored by the Ethnologisches Museum in Berlin where he went on a second trip and collected everything he could, human remains, photos, objects, and uh, donated them to the museum because he was friends with the director, Felix von Luschan. And it was like, okay, you pay for my trip and I will give you the objects. Kind of deal. So the recurrent reference to the bird, both dead as a test object and alive as a bird, is emblematic of Neuhaus positioning himself as the German expert on both interferential photography 
that was more associated with Gabriel Lippmann and France, and as the specialist on New Guinea in the field of anthropology. He even had this project, and this is like fascinating. He wanted to um, fly with a hot air balloon from Berlin to New Guinea and do like an aerial mapping of the islands with another uh, color photographer, but no one would fund that project. Like no one in Berlin in the colonial administration would actually pay money for this. And much later when there was an aerial mapping campaign of Bavaria in the south of Germany, it took like 64 years to map Bavaria from the sky. So probably mapping New Guinea and the islands would have taken a good century. Well, he tried and that didn't work, so. His entire preoccupation with the region should be understood within the historical and epistemological framework of the German empire colonizing the New Guinea archipelago starting 1884 and of the previous European economic exploitation of its people, the forced possession, controlling and displaying of its flora and fauna, which Neuhaus details at length in his 1911 book, relaying his trip to Papua New Guinea, Deutsch Neuguinea, as it was called at the time. So in this book, he calls the living parrot a blob of color, Faben Klexa, due to the brightness of its adjoining shades. While the bird of paradise, another species of birds, was to him a color artist, Faben Künstler. Together, they constitute a paradisiac perfection, he writes, in their uniqueness and in their deviation from archetype, Uafon. When describing the bird of paradise's shimmering colors, Shela Faben, Neuhaus compares them to the shades of a Lippmann plate. Indeed, the colors of the bird's feathers are due to interference of light waves and not pigments. So kind of like the soap bubble that I showed you at the beginning. And like a Lippmann plate. And Neuhaus finds that both the feathers and the plate, due to this interference, they have a maximum of liveliness, höchste Lebendigkeit. So it gives them something, a kind of liveliness that he doesn't find in other photographic processes. And indeed, feathers are a very loved motif in the contemporary practice of Lippmann photography, as you see here in the interferential plate of the amazing Felipe Alves, who uses um, old emulsions in order to make beautiful and stunning Lippmann plates. And I am delighted to say that um, I will be featuring one of his plates, not this one, at my exhibition in Norway. So he's definitely worth checking out and his website is below. So for this color photograph to have been made possible, the actual bird had to be killed and its feathers had to be kept. It had to be stuffed. In guaranteeing the parrots as colors, taxidermy allowed this test object to safeguard the stability of the testing conditions and ultimately the veracity of the results. Taxidermy transformed the living and moving bird to a stationary sitter with low risk of discoloration whose visual properties are still and immutable. This was necessary for testing since any change in its shades or position could skew the experiment's results and confound the reading of the sensitivity of the emulsion. Colonialism's extractive logic brought specimens and images of rare and beautiful and often the adult male animal, which embody the perfect expression of their type from one part of the world to the other. This parrot sat permanently on Neuhaus's balcony in Berlin. Despite the death of the bird, the assumed liveliness of interferential color photography was thought to restore some of the dead bird's original vivacity. The black background seen here plays no role in the photographic experiment, as in using it or not, was not a parameter Neuhaus sought to measure, to improve upon or change. 
To him, it merely made the image more pleasant to look at and increased the contrast between the color motif and what is behind it. From within the standards of anthropological photography, which Neuhaus knew and practiced well, the neutral background is an extra gesture of removal of the animal from its natural habitat, abstracting it out of the milieu of which it was part, turning it into a type. Therefore, the stuffed bird is not only an experimental artifact that is part of the material culture of laboratory science, but, is, but it is also an artifact of nature due to its ontological ambiguity between object and animal, both dead and alive. Its skin, that does not decay, bears the mark of the colonial violence, and it literally became the chromatic standard against which Neuhaus gauged the success of his experiments and baseline color and color contrast in the science of photography, thus complicating its role as the Shirley card of the Lippmann process. Comparing the photograph of the test object with the object itself, was essential for the legitimacy of the Lippmann process and of the photographer. The durability of color promised by taxidermy allowed test objects such as the stuffed parrot and other animals to be readily available for contrasting with their photographic image. So this comparative practice adds to the privileged relationship between these two media, taxidermy and color photography, that was independent of country. So this is not a practice, so comparison is not a practice that was only used in Germany and the French had another method. No, it's an overarching um, approach to understanding mimesis. During the Champ de Mars exhibition in Paris in 1892, Gabriel Lippmann projected several interferential images, one of a group of flags, one of a plate of oranges, one of a stained glass window, and one of a stuffed bird. A British observer, Cameron Swan, lamented that the depicted objects were not shown next to their image for comparison. He damagingly concluded that the problem of color photography is not yet solved since he cannot confirm that the photographic image actually reproduces the shades of the objects. What if it was reproducing something entirely different? How can we know? Whereas out of all of the things that, Neu that uh, Lippmann presented at the exhibition, only the flag and the stuffed bird could have maintained their colors long enough to have been transported to the exhibition. Well, you can't move a window, and by that time, the oranges have either decayed or someone got hungry. So it's a, like that kind of argument. Okay. But still, people felt the need to compare the object to the image to make sure that the colors were mimetic, that it made sense that this kind of color technology is doing what it proclaims it is doing. That same year, 1892, in Berlin, Hermann Wilhelm Vogel created a three-color photomechanical printing company whose paragon from 1892, as you see here, is called Oil Painting and Natural Butterflies. And it is a photographic montage of Rotterdam artist Peter Jacobs Dufhusen's painting, Die Spitzenklöperin, The Lace Maker. And also the color scale, which I have marked here in yellow, is supposed to help prove that color reproduction in this print is consistent and matches the scale. So if you look at this color scale, for example, at one of the shades of blue, and you look at the ribbon on the hat of the lace maker, they're supposed to match in order to prove that it's a consistent kind of print. When comparing this print, which also depicts South American butterflies whose provenance and whereabouts are unknown, with the actual mounted insects themselves, Neuhaus said that the butterflies antennae in the image are all blue, whereas 
the insects antennae in real life have various colors. So this contention led to skepticism vis-a-vis -vis Fogel's printing method that, according to Neuhaus, cannot guarantee a good color reproduction, thus becoming, in his words, inadequate, mangelhaft. So I've seen this print in Cologne, and the colors of the antennae of the butterflies are not all blue. So either the image had degraded by the time I got to look at it, or Neuhaus was looking at another print, not the one that I looked at, or, and this is my kind of what I'm tending towards in my theory, that he put this print under a microscope and saw something entirely different because this practice of putting color images under a microscope was common at the time. And so if it was the case, and he still made this comment against Vogel's work, it's a bit unfair because reading his text, one would assume that he is making, he's reaching his conclusions based on the naked eye and not on a microscope. But they didn't really like each other, Neuhaus and Vogel. So it's a bit of an interesting argument in terms of what it reveals about group dynamics at the time between photographers. So Neuhaus was not happy. In response, Vogel was underwhelmed by the Lippmann process for a variety of reasons, including the fact that it's a hassle to make, it cannot be reproduced, and most importantly, because of its surface reflection. The stuffed parrot as a test object can be seen just fine, but its interferential images materiality is such that it has so much surface reflection that the viewer has to chase its colors to be able to see them. The shades of the parrot's image alter and at times disappear altogether, as you see here in the photo, which um, I took with my phone, depending on the angle through which light strikes the glass surface to Fogel's great displeasure. And so even if, and this is something that a lot of uh, interferential photographers did, even if you glue a glass wedge prism on your actual image, it has an inclination of 10 degrees, it's not going to change that much because you still have to hold the image in your hand and do an entire dance around it to make sure that the colors will reveal themselves at some point when you get to the right angle. So it needs some patience. It's a very slow um, perceptive experience. Hence, in the gap between, on the one hand, the stuffed parrots or the mounted butterflies, either from Papua New, New Guinea or South America, and on the other hand, their photographic rendition laid the legitimacy of color technologies. Moreover, the stuffed parrot as test object solidified its status as a staple of Neuhaus's laboratory by having reflexive implications for both process and scientist. By comparing the parrot as animal object to its photographic representation, Neuhaus tracked down his process in creating and refining the emulsions needed to generate the image. The test object laid bare the failure of the trial when its colors could not be rendered, and in doing so, helped the photographer generate new knowledge about emulsion sensitivity, optimize the process, and ultimately it examined the virtue of the photographer and his or her persistence. Yet, irrelevant of the experimental stability afforded by the seemingly unchanging stuffed parrot, the parrot doesn't move and its colors don't really decay, or at least not very fast in time. So despite all of this, Neuhaus was not entirely shielded from the arbitrariness of his photographic work. As Peter Geimer writes, since the days of the earliest photographic processes, photographers had been dealing with substances whose activities were neither predictable nor completely under their control. Like them, Neuhaus was incapable of determining the exact nature of the phenomena precluding his success in generating a color image, as his answer to a reader of the Photographische Rundschau in 1895 reveals. 
So what happened was that Neuhaus in his journal in the Rundschau would answer the questions by the readers. And there was a reader who kept sending him letters nonstop saying that she or he bought all the books that they could get about the Lippmann process and they were trying them to the letter every day for hours and they were still not getting any kind of color on their image. And they were asking Neuhaus and wondering why that is and what could they do differently. So Neuhaus answers with his usual mixture of disinterest and disdain and says, yes, thank you. You know, I've received your hundreds of letters and I understand your frustration. What I can tell you is that using or trying the Lippmann process in winter is not conducive to good results. So your best bet is to stop what you're doing right now and try again in the summertime. Thank you, bye. So, I mean, this is really interesting because I was asking a conservator, Jens Gold, who's doing brilliant research on the restoration of Lippmann plates at Poiss Museum in Norway about why that is. And the theory is that it has to do with the humidity of the air. That because in the winter time, the air was, so hum was not humid at all, the photographic emulsion is not likely to respond very well. Whereas in the summertime, with more humidity in the air, it's better, like the conditions are better for color photography. But arguably Neuhaus did not know this in 1895, because if he did, he would have probably said so, since he was keen on making sure that a lot of people tried the Lippmann process to make sure that he has a hand or that he can be commercially successful if he manages to industrialize it, which, you know, didn't happen. So given the little control that scientists had over interferential photography, the reliable test object, such as the parrot, proved essential in anchoring the photographer amid the confusion surrounding its science. When the photographic process did work out, the fortunate depiction of the stuffed bird, one that matched the test object, synthesized in a single image Neuhaus's years of experimental and theoretical research. It would have an iconic status as, I quote, a carrier of the great weight of evidence, end quote. So much so that Neuhaus sent a photograph of the parrot to Gabriel Lippmann himself as proof of his success. And another one to the Deutsches Museum in 1906 as a gift and exemplary sample of the interferential process to be part of the museum's collection of scientific photography. To sum up, unlike how some photography historians claim, the Lippmann process was not the isolated practice of a lonely scientist who had his 15 minutes of fame and faded away. It unfolded rather in a specific historical moment in France at a time when the country was being torn apart by anti-Semitism, the rise of right-wing movements and rivalry with the German empire. Lippmann's reception in the German empire was as contentious as it was stable. Richard Neuhaus's engagement with the Lippmann process lasted a good decade, which is a lot of time for a color technology around 1900. An essential part of his photographic practice was determining the right test object and testing conditions. Neuhaus's calibration of color contrast and emulsion sensitivity took place in relation to the shades of a colonial animal object par excellence, a stuffed bird. The bird's very presence in the laboratory in Berlin was enabled by another technology of empire, taxidermy, and by Neuhaus's various other pursuits as anthropologists specializing in New Guinea, Australia, and Hawaii at a time when the German empire was a colonial power. Taxidermy gave color photography what it coveted best, immutably colored skin or plumage, and an animal that is docile enough to be tested as long as it takes to reach the ideal image. Color photography gave taxidermy 
the only mechanical image that is truly in its own likeness, one that most encapsulates what taxidermy violently preserves best, skin. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Hanin, uh, Hanouj. And we are now going to take a short break. And when we return, we will open up our question and answer period. All right, congratulations, uh, Dr. Hanouj. That was a wonderful presentation. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I will stop the uh, recording now.